June 12, 1991, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines is just another hill on the horizon. Suddenly there's an eruption, and the mountain for three days is spewing ash and smoke until there's one major catastrophic eruption where over 10 cubic kilometers of rock and debris are exploded as high as 35 kilometers up into the stratosphere. And that all happened in nine hours. So the whole uh, volcanic eruption from beginning to end is a matter of a few days, and the big eruptions were a matter of a few hours. When it was all over and the sky had cleared, on the lower left is all that was left of the top of Mount Pinatubo. The area was blown clean. Now, Pinatubo was a large eruption, but in the last 8,000 years, we've seen uh, four eruptions that have been 10 times larger. Um, and over geologic time, we've seen many eruptions that are uh, 100 times larger than Pinatubo, such as Yellowstone or Toba or some of the other major eruptions. What typically follows a big explosive eruption is a cooling. Uh, the eruption of Tambora in 1815 was the biggest of the ones here on the screen, Mount Katmai and Mount Krakatoa, uh, and it caused the infamous year without a summer, where it cooled off the earth, uh, typically for much more than a half a degree centigrade for about three years, in this case even a few more years. But what's interesting is that following Pinatubo, there was also warming observed in the winter. Uh, Pinatubo erupted in June, and by December, January, there was significant warming observed in the Northern Hemisphere. The question is what caused the warming and what causes the cooling uh, that's, a, that's very clearly associated with explosive eruptions. Now we're standing at Barthabunga eruption in Iceland. Many of you may not have heard of this, but it erupt, started erupting in August of 2014. It's in central Iceland. It didn't explode a lot of things into the air, so it didn't interfere with air traffic. But it extruded lava out over an area of 33 square uh, miles, or uh, 80 square kilometers, something in an area that's about the size of Manhattan. And these types of eruptions, uh, don't tend to explode much up into the stratosphere, but they can cover very large areas uh, with basalt, and this is a more primitive magma, which has much higher content of gas than the more evolved magmas uh, from Pinatubo. So what we find is that there are two very different styles of volcanism. One is an uh, example of Pinatubo, where it uh, was a very explosive eruption, it led to cooling, it only lasts for a few hours. Another is Barthabunga, where over six months, uh, it lasted extruding lava pretty much the whole time. Uh, it was not particularly explosive, it was relatively safe to stand as close as we see these people, uh, because it just kept coming out, and it can keep coming out incessantly. Now, some years ago I got interested in the Greenland ice sheet drilling program. And basically this, is, this was an effort of, of three dozen scientists who drilled in central Greenland holes to depths of about 9,000 feet, looking at climate going back 100,000 years or more. And what they did was uh, very carefully try to figure out the age at each depth in the ice, mainly by counting annual layers, but checking it with other methods. They also measured the oxygen-18 isotopes in the gas bubbles within the ice to try to determine the temperature at the time that the ice was formed. And they also measured uh, sulfate, which comes from sulfur dioxide, primarily from vol uh, erupting volcanoes. So it gives some index as to how much volcanism there was. And what we see when we look at just the sulfate content over the last 15,000 years, uh, 25,000 years, 25,000 years ago being the, the low of the last uh, glacial ice age, is that it peaked very much around 10,000 years ago. And when we add the, the temperature data 
what we see is that during the preboreal warming, uh, that volcanism was very high for several thousand years, at least 2,000 years. And this was enough to warm the ocean such that we came out of the Ice Age at about 10,000 years ago uh, into the Holocene. And so the temperatures have remained relatively constant. What's very important is the ocean holds most of the heat content of the climate Earth system, and it takes a while uh, to warm the ocean. We can warm the surface of the ocean, but the depth of the ocean is a whole other story. So what we see here is that in the bowling warming, several thousand years before the preboreal warming, there was a lot of volcanism. It did last for a while, but it wasn't able to warm the ocean out of the last ice age. So when the volcanism began to decrease again, uh, we got pulled back into the ice age. Now, volcanoes under ice tend to grow vertically. Uh, they kind of, like bar the bunga, instead of spreading it out over a large area, they grow vertically. And this kind of table mountain, or tuya, uh, is very common in Iceland. And during the preboreal warming, we can point to the actual volcanoes that were erupting at that time. So not only can we say that when we warmed out of the last ice age, it was probably volcanism that caused the warming, but we can actually identify the specific volcanoes. Now, when we look at this over a much longer period of time, 120,000 years, we see there are many, many times, in fact, there are about 25 major times when there was sudden warming, sudden being within a few years, usually less than a decade when you actually start looking at the data. But then we drifted back into the Ice Age over centuries to millennia. And on average, every 4,000 years, there was a fundamental change uh, in climate, out of the Ice Age, back into the Ice Age. Just imagine what it was like for our ancestors dealing with those kind of changes at that time. And that's one of the reasons they migrated and, and many of the other things that we observe. Well, what's really important here is that there's continual change going on. And in this case, it's, it's in the Ice Age conditions, out of the Ice Age conditions. Now, the question is, what causes this warming, this sudden warming? And there was a, uh, read in a paper back in 2009 or whatever, just a casual mention that following Pinatubo eruption was the lowest ozone measured uh, at any time since measurements began in 1927. This graph shows the annual ozone at Orosa, Switzerland, which is the oldest station measuring ozone. And when you measure ozone, every measurement is different. It's changing all the time, by the minute, by the hour, by the day. But when you sum up an, an average over longer periods of time, you begin to see a trend. In this case, we're talking annual uh, averages. And what I want you to notice most is that following Pinatubo, 1992, 1993, the significant drop in ozone. And just nine years later, there was a significant drop following the eruption of AF Fiatlierkel, which was the volcano that caused the interruption of, of airspace uh, that we heard about a lot. But that was a much smaller eruption, but it was much more basaltic uh, than, uh, than Pinatubo. So we have very clear observation uh, after most uh, uh, volcanic eruptions of dropping of the ozone layer, uh, decreasing of the size of the, of the ozone layer. So what is ozone? Well, ozone is a molecule that contains three atoms of oxygen. And when uh, ultraviolet sea light comes down from the sun, it has enough energy, about four times the energy of visible light, to break the oxygen uh, atom, uh, oxygen molecule apart into two atoms of, of oxygen. These can recombine to form a molecule of ozone. Then ultraviolet B radiation coming in from the sun is only about 1.4 times the energy of visible light, but it's enough energy to break the uh, ozone molecule down back into a molecule of oxygen and an atom of oxygen. This cycle goes on incessantly, where ozone is totally different from almost every other gas we talk about in the atmosphere, is its life cycle, it only, a given molecule only lasts for about uh, eight days. It's continually being created and destroyed, created and destroyed. 
And every time we split oxygen apart or we split ozone apart, we create heat. And so this is what primarily warms the uh, stratosphere about Earth. Most of us know the temperature decreases as we go up in elevation up into the mountains, but then when you get to the stratosphere, it gets warmer again. And it's the ultraviolet energy coming from the sun that is leading to the warming of the stratosphere. This comes to a, a greatest value in the ozone layer, which essentially forms a blanket around Earth. It's like an electric blanket. The energy is coming from the sun. It's not coming from Earth. And this plays a major role in Earth's temperature. And the hottest energy from the sun to reach Earth typically is ultraviolet B. And when you deplete the ozone layer, more ultraviolet B reaches the Earth. We can measure it. We can see it. And it increases your risk of sunburn and skin cancer. Now, back in the 1960s, we began to manufacture a lot of chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs. These are very inert chemicals, and they were very useful for spray can propellants, for refrigerants like Freon, uh, for solvents, and other things where we didn't want it to interact with the material. But what scientists discovered back in 1974 was that these CFCs, when uh, they get up into the upper atmosphere, particularly in very cold environment, can be broken down to release chlorine. And this is particularly uh, efficient in polar stratospheric clouds that are most common in winter in polar regions. One atom of chlorine can destroy 100,000 molecules of ozone. So very small amounts of CFCs broken down uh, up in the lower stratosphere can lead to significant ozone depletion, which can lead to more ultraviolet B energy reaching Earth, which can lead to major warming. Sure enough, we saw the chlorine and the CFCs increasing from the late 60s. Uh, and the temperature bars shown here are the uh, average global temperatures uh, by, measured by the four major syntheses of global temperatures all agree with this basic structure of, of the change in temperature over time. In 1985, we discovered the Antarctic ozone hole. And uh, by that time, most scientists had come to understand that it was possible that the CFCs were causing that problem. The ozone hole suddenly put some urgency behind that problem. And so we passed the UN Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer. Here you see the green line is the uh, increase in chlorofluorocarbons, the black line is the increase in ozone depletion, and the red uh, are the temperature. And what we noticed was that by 19, 1989 is when the Montreal Protocol took effect, limiting production of CFCs. By 1993, uh, the, CF, the increase in CFCs had stopped. By 1995, the increase in ozone depletion had stopped. By 1998, the increase in temperature had stopped. And temperature had remained very constant from 1998 to 2013, known as the global warming hiatus. Now, the major warming uh, was, we would expect in this case, to be where the major depletion of ozone was. And the major depletion of ozone was in Antarctica. Uh, and sure enough, there was warming of about 14 degrees Fahrenheit, the greatest warming observed anywhere in the last 1,300 years. So what we get back to is that an eruption like Pinatubo explodes chlorine and bromine up into the atmosphere and depletes ozone, causing that winter warming. But it also explodes sulfur dioxide and water vapor, which makes a aerosol or mist in the lower stratosphere just below the ozone layer, and over a matter of months, that grows large enough to reflect and scatter sunlight. And this leads to ultimate global cooling over several years. In the case of Barthabunga, we're also erupting chlorine and bromine. Uh, but, and this leads to global warming. We're not forming aerosols. So we have explosive cooling with aerosol formation. And we have effusive warming with no aerosol formation. Now, if we look back at uh, mass extinctions, what this audience is most interested in, 
we see that the Siberian basalts uh, were the time of the of major extinction 250 million years ago. These covered an area of Siberia almost as large as the United States. Just think of lava flows going all the way from New York City uh, to San Francisco uh, throughout. Also, of course, the uh, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province and the Deccan basalts or Deccan traps in India. So what I wanted to get through uh, was just the idea that this cycling is going on. We see it a lot. And this is just some work from Peter Giles looking at brachiopod habitat temperatures. And we won't go into that in detail. You see it in the geology, this fine layering. This was uh, mainly between uh, the formation of, of uh, OK. Thank you. Uh, I wasted a lot of time up front. 